Kia ora tātou. Did that come across right? Can you hear me? Okay, oh. Oh. Kia ora tātou. Ai kā tika a he mihi anō tēnei a kia koutou ngā haukainga, ngā ahi kā mai te kura a whārei ki te hirau. A nei mātou ngā uri o te tauráwhiti o ngā uri o te tauráwhiti. Um, ai, he mihi anō. Um, so we, we've been involved in one of the research projects under the Sustainable Seas Challenge in the Tangaroa Programme. Uh, that's called Huatokina o Hapue. Huatokina um, is a phrase re refers, well, referred to in the past as um, abundance and thriving communities and livelihoods from our taiao. Um, but for this project, we we've kind of flipped it because um, we recognise that um, we're this side of economic colla uh, environmental collapse um, and that's even before the cyclones that ran through last year. So, um, and that's environmental collapse and also some of our other kaikoho have referred to um, the loss or the erosion in our social and cultural values as well. So, um, in that, in acknowledging the challenges, I suppose, and our needs, uh, we had two main work streams in our rangahau. Uh, one put us in the moana, that was the cool work stream. Everyone wanted to be with uh, the divers. Sarah Jane is one of our divers. Um, and we worked with two of our hapu collectives, uh, Ngā Hapu o Waipiro and our uh, Te Aitanga Mate, our hapu collective in Whariponga. Eh? Oh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> That's the boss over there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Gee, auntie, you buggered me up while I was singing. Oh, um, oh, oh, yeah. So, so there was the in uh, uh, that focused on monitoring or the in sea mahi. Um, there was translo translocation of kina because we could see the onset of kina barons forming. Um, and, and the hapu collectives have their respective uh, relationships with other organisations like us in Whariponga with Otago Uni, so we had Kahapatakai baseline surveys, we're about in our 15th year um, of that, and then we, we also, the bro hangs out with us, um, and we've trialled Modi Compass as a monitoring approach uh, for us in freshwater and, and on the moana side of things. And then um, the other work stream is what I'll say is policy and legislative uh, interfaces with our sense of mana moana. Um, so very hard to pull a policy party amongst our crew, um, but we, we have been fortunate that some of our hapu members um, are either policy geeks or put a mōhio and want to tell us what they think um, hapu lead policy should be. So, so coming here today, coming to this kaupapa, our contribution to improving ocean outcomes with indigenous knowledge and innovation um, is just to share some of our insights. And um, we do focus a lot on the policy side, um, but Ian will also cover uh, adapting the Māori compass for the marine, our tonga species in the marine setting. Uh, so we're going to talk more about the Ngārohe Mōno Ngā Hapu Ngā Tipurau Act and the build-up to that was the deed of agreement. Um, and so that's basically all our marae and Ngā Tipurau on, on this map. They're coloured because we've collectivised in that way and we've collectivised in relation to how we access our coastline. So coastline or rohe moana, you know, it's, it's quite, it's, it's had a huge impact on us as we've moved um, to respond to when the foreshore and seabed act got introduced. Um, the map on the other side is rohe moana out to three? Oh, out to 12 nautical miles. Um, customary title so far has only been, de been determined to three nautical miles. You see you got some gaps, some of our hapu didn't want to join in 
to the Ngarohe Moana Kaupapa. Um, te akau o Tokomaru, Ngā Hapu o Tokomaru Akau, they've just uh, received CMT through the MACA process. Uh, but anyway, that's just a bit more context of where we're coming from. I'll just pass it to Auntie Egg to talk more about the Ngarohe Moana o Ngāti Purau. Oh, well, kia ora everybody. Um, just want to give a little bit of a whakapapa about um, Aroha Mona and, um, you know, just thinking back to Jack's corridor this morning, you know, we've all been on our journeys long before Sustainable Seas arrived at our doorsteps and we'll continue our journeys after Sustainable Seas departs. Um, so this has been a very long journey for Ngā Hapu o Ngāti Pro. Um, and it started right back in 2003 with the Ngāti Upper conversation. And at that time, as, as hapu within Ngāti Pro, and you've got to remember contextually, we were looking at uh, settlements with iwi and all of that sort of stuff. So iwi had a very strong place within the relationships with the, with the Crown and, and on our behalf as whānau and hapu. So when the Ngāti Upper case took the forefront, it was the hapu people who went to the to our iwi authority and said, we want you to go and have a cup of tea with those people in the beehive and go and represent our interests as, uh, as hapu of Ngāti Parau. Because as far as we're concerned, we have always owned the rohe mōna of Ngāti Parau from the day we got here, long before the Treaty of Waitangi, and we'll always own it uh, into the future. So that's where it started from. So we had very strong assertions of our, of our mana motuhake. So, um, and that piece of legislation in 2004, which stole it and uh, vested it in the, in the right of the Crown, and essentially in return of taking it, they said to us as Ngāti Pro Hapu, um, for taking the ownership of your foreshore and seabed, we will g give you in exchange some legal rights and interests. So we negotiated a deed of agreement which has all these legal rights and interests, and we uh, signed that with the Crown in 2008. We didn't actually, um, we actually didn't legislate it till 2019. It went through t about three changes of the New Zealand government at the time. And the government actually asked us to hold back on progressing our, our, our bill. Um, and they replaced the uh, MACA Act in between there somewhere. Yeah. So in 2019, the journey came to a, a, a recognition where we, we got an act of parliament which gives us lots of rights and interests. We have some customary marine titles awarded from the mean high water springs to the three nautical miles, and they give us some additional rights and interests. So we've got about 12 of those areas re recognised throughout Ngā Hapu and Ngāti Pro, and in there we have things like, um, we have permission right and resource consenting. So essentially if anyone wants to come along and do a resource consent in any of our CMT areas, those hapu have an automatic uh, permission right which just says yes or no and we don't have to give you a reason why. So it is actually quite a strong recognition. In 2002, we've spent a lot of time developing up our fisheries plans and a lot of our conversation comes off the uh, fisheries of the work that we've done with ourselves in, in the fisheries areas. Um, in 2023, a lot of the work that we've done is around um, building our, our um, governance uh, capability and uh, developing our capacity. That's actually two steps forward and 25 back. <laughs> and then about another six forward. And, um, and so essentially when you get opportunities like, uh, like this uh, bit of research, it actually gives you the opportunity to, um, um, to find some suckers like these guys here who did the research. I just come along and say, yeah, I think we're doing all right now. Let's not do that. Or why don't we do something else? Uh, yeah, so, so it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful having this opportunity. And yeah, I, and I suppose one of the key things if you look at our deed, what it actually says to us as Ngāti Pro is that the Crown acknowledges and recognises that Ngā Hapu or Ngāti Pro continue to assert that they have ongoing and enduring ownership interest unbroken by both the Foreshore and Seabed Act and the MACA Act. And the mana of Ngāhapu o Ngāti Pro in relation to Ngārohe Mōno o Ngāhapu o Ngāti Pro is unbroken, inalienable and enduring and is held by Ngāhapu o Ngāti Pro as a collective right. 
Um, it provides legal mechanisms and instruments which contribute to the legal expression, protection, and recognition of that continued exercise of mana by ourselves within our mona. So only within those blue parts of that map do we have a right to say what we think about our space and our place. There is something like 15 instruments within our deed of agreement. We have a relationship through 28 different acts of parliament. Uh, and some of the key areas that we focused on in this research was our fisheries mechanism and our extended fisheries mechanism. Um, we also are going to start working on uh, our environmental covenant. That's just a right to write our world view as we see it within our environment from the mountains to the sea. Because essentially, it's not only about what happens in Aroha Mona, it's about what impacts on Aroha Mona as well, which we have a right to talk about. One of the key fundamentals in our deed of agreement, in my, my opinion, is, is actually the relationship instruments. We have, a, we have a very prescriptive way that the government agencies like MPI, Department of the Conservation People, uh, Ministry of Environment, how they should re 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 relate with us and how they should work with us. So unlike some of our, like our treaty settlement, which is quite, can be quite generic, it's actually very prescriptive about the rights and obligations the Crown has towards Ngā Hapo Ngā Now, while you might have those rights and interests, making them happen is another story. Um, so the principles underlying the deed, if you, I don't need to go through all that, you can all see it and read it, but essentially the other good thing about this deed agreement is based on principles. And essentially what the Crown has said to us and what we've said to the Crown is if we disagree with each other, these are the key things that should be taken into consideration. So running your mourner governance and management around key principles that are negotiated directly with the Crown gives you a great starting point. And we've got 48 hapu who signed the deed, and we operate under six, man six kaitaki trusts. Kia ora. Um, so, so, yeah, we, we do have the principles, and they're defined like that in the deed and the act. But when we show that to our ones at home, they're like, what are you going on about? That, that's not, you know, so it's not engaging. Um, but we... Oh, so, so as part of the research, what we did was we um, undertook uh, wānanga, basically, with the hapu to sort of take out those top four lines and just ask them, what does toitu te mana atua mean to you? Um, so we were gaining their hapu understandings of these principles. Um, we asked them, what some activities or practices that you relate to your understanding of toitu te mana atua. So we can go through toitu te mana whenua me te mana moana, toitu te mana tangata, and toitu te tiriti o waitangi. And, and it, it, was a big, it was a chance because we were trying to hold um, rangahau Wānanga during COVID, so we, we actually had to facilitate them online by Zoom. Um, but it has helped us, uh, I suppose, identify values, uh, yeah, principles and values, and then actual actions or practices. And um, we're actually using oh, practices which, which can cross uh, across the toy to principles. So like in... Um, Toitu te mana whenua me te mana mōna, we have wānanga, āhapu, hikoi, we promote three to four generations every time we try and do something. And this isn't us as the research team, this is us as the hapu, as hapu members organising things. Um, you know, what about, the res what about the partnership to do, to enter into this research project, how does that partnership um, give effect to or celebrate those toitu principles. So trying to make it real simple and every day um, so that it's, it's actually, you know, it's normal for our home ones. Um, and this is all building up to, I suppose, what we're calling hapu-led policy development. Um, at Te Aua Te Mona we spoke about using Te Pao Tangaroa as a, as a framework for us 
developing our customary fisheries plans. Um, and this is, a, this, this is focused on the principles, but it's, this, it's about um, if you know your values or principles and you know some of your practices, you will be able to um, draft and develop policies that make sense to your home people. Um, and then we flip that, those two two principles again into what we hope is a decision making tool. And I'll just ask Sarah Jane to come up and give a call to all about that. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, so you would have seen earlier we sort of had the same look and it had the principles as they are written in the deed of agreement. Um, so what we did to develop this tool was we um, we took the hapu understandings of the toy two principles and framed them into questions for in a way to ensure that um, every decision we make will give effect to the fundamental principles and values that our pakeke entered into um, the deed of agreement under. Um, yeah, so it ensures that all gov governance decisions are hapu-centric um, in accordance with our tikanga and for the betterment of our collective and taiao. Um, a good thing about it is we can translate it across scales, whether it be um, a decision, a marae, a hapu, as landowners or as whānau. Um, and it enables us to put our principles um, into practice. Um, so, moving forward, when we're making regulations and bylaws, um, it keeps us in check with our tikanga and our worldview, and we think that every good decision is a toy two decision. Um, yeah, so we've got like a little overarching statement there. So, toy two decisions are made using te kawa oranga, which is to collectively ensure, preserve, maintain and sustain the modi of everything living including our natural resources, our people, our language, our traditional and cultural practices. And then, yeah, so based on the hapu's understandings, the question like for Toitu Te Manatua would be, will this decision preserve or contribute to positive connections between tangata whenua and taiao ecosystems? Um, yeah, and you can see the other, one, the other questions. But we think that if you can answer yes to all of these questions and give examples of what that looks like, then yes, it is a good toy two decision. Yeah. Just talking about legacy and uh, yep, see the young fellows there, that's Kahu on the left and Hari Chairs on the right. So uh, just sort of, yeah, just giving some sort of thing about, okay, what we do now, it's all about, you know, building in that, that longevity, um, the robustness so that uh, our our muko and muko's muko can uh, carry on the, the fight. Okay. Oops, maybe I don't know too far. Ah, maybe comes. Okay, yeah, so you're first acknowledging all the other ropu that are presenting today. Amazing mahi and to be standing alongside you with the same um, trials and tribulations that we've been through in the last 10 years. Oh, the past 10 years. Uh, some of us have yeah, done it harder than others. So yeah, mahi atu. Um, and secondly, uh, to, to, my, to, to my team, I'm um, the sort of the tech on Aitanga Mahaki sort of diversity, iwi diversity uh, part to the Rufu. We but work with anyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, it, just to go back and reflect, every time we'd call a hui and a wanarang down Whareponga or Waipiro Bay, there'd be a weather event, there'd be roads knocked out, there'd be power out, there'd be all sorts of things. And I felt for my for my whanaunga and, and that what they were doing to rearrange and, and you know, scramble to get the mahi done, so um, yeah, big ups um, for to get us here. Um, the compass, the legacy, again, uh, there's a kai kōrero this morning, a guy was talking about uh, the Takitumu waka and Tupai and Rua Faru. 
they're talking there, and they go around um, planting these Modi stones. And I remember at that quarter, because uh, they came further around to Tūranga Nui Akiwa, and they planted a Modi stone in the, um, what is now the port for Koda rock lobster to attract the Koda. Centuries later, I go and do my masters at Waikato, and that's the largest crayfish nursery in the country. And one of the things was, oh, how come it's so popular? Why there and not Tauranga Port, why not Auckland Port with the bigger, flasher, high decile places? And my dad said, oh, actually, you might just want to do some, some historical research. I said, no, 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 we could be in Calenters, Bunsen burners, and, you know, we're playing music in there and trying to attract them. And so it happened. Decades later, that, yeah, his, his words, if I listened a bit earlier, would have saved a bit of uh, headache. Um, but yeah, you go, go into those uh, cordial about Takitumu and how they've gone around them. Sure enough, they later planted the Modi stone to attract the coda. And hopefully, the nursery, the kohanga for coda is still there. But yeah, that's, that's, that's another research project. Um, sorry, so yeah, zip back to the legacy. So this is where it all sort of came from. And there's several of you in the room that uh, might remember me and Dad knocking on doors and going around Marae, uh, teaching tuna, biology of tuna along with yeah, the road de uh, deers and, and his, his uh, expertise. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but we're actually forming this type of this tool. And it took us 300, and I think, and I'm trying to get uh, my sons up to, well, at least a couple, of <laughs> a couple of those. Yeah, so, and that's where the, the tool came from. And it was um, ground truth, multiple case studies with Whareponga, in the freshwater world, it's not quite so fresh, but in the freshwater world, and now we're in, into the marine version, thinking it was going to be quite a major modification to it, but actually, it didn't actually, the, the hardest, the oh, trickiest thing is just to change the tonga species. All the other things is, is rock solid, the tikanga connections of tanga to whenua are rock solid, and those carry on, diversity, but you change it, uh, Tonga species from a tuna to a coda to a pawa. Uh, we're going to try kororā next week, which will be a bit of a bit of a new one. Getting into uh, what are they birds? Man, well anyway, yeah, yeah. So, something a bit different. But then yeah, everything sort of stays uh, solid. And but the most important thing about the legacy part, and this is uh, sort of the, my last point, is about the education. So in, any time we do this, we have. Um, accredited courses for introductory course and assessors course. So we've adapted, we've got new uh, online hybrid learning resources for marine species. So when we roll into a new rohe, new iwi, so what's your, you know, what's your, what's your favourite uh, time of species? And we dial that up and then calibrate it. So it's all about calibrating too. So even though we all might love tuna inland or kind of kota power, there's also that calibration that has to be adjusted for time, effects of events, but mainly the tikanga and kawa that sit within each hapu and iwi. So, kia ora. So we're just near, our, near the end of our kōrero. Um, so in our final deliverable that's due to the challenge, um, these are some of the key messages. We're just trying to make them more punchy, I suppose, so that they make sense for our ones at home. Um, but it just reiterates, I suppose, all of our roles here that um, iwi taketake, kaitiaki, ahika, haukainga, we have an important role to play in ocean ma management and governance, all parts of it. Um, only we can play those roles. Only we can evaluate ma Māori. Um, so it's a call to other players and stakeholders in oceans management and governance to not just pay us lip service but to integrate our, our ways of doing things and, and the things that should be done. Um, there's a big push for governance for collective benefits. Um, our moana, you know, we can't put fences on it and wāwāhi it to just certain ones um, and to think of benefits, not just uh, money, not, not just money um, associated with that. Um, yeah, we all know working with our whānau and hapu is pretty complex and some can do some things and 
most can't do some things. Um, so to acknowledge the navigator roles, various ones in our whānau and hapu can play and to uh, support them in that. Um, and then what we've seen in, in working through our customary fisheries plans is, um, yeah, the agencies just can't cope or handle or fathom um, where we're coming from half the time, so there's been a huge learning curve for them. Um, but kia kaha, stick to your guns, don't just take their templates that they want you to, bo uh, you know, boxes to fill in and, and boxes to, to tick. Um, yeah, stay to to the ways that we want to approach uh, management and governance. And Auntie Egg's going to finish off with a corridor on systems change. You can leave that there. W one of the things that we did realise in our in our research and working with our deed of agreement is that um, it's really hard for ourselves as Fano to actually understand a 300-page document and an act of Parliament. And so, um, you know, we fell across this thing in, in the days of working with. Uh, with Healthy Families, New Zealand actually, and they took a very, uh, they took a, a, a huge systemic approach to health prevention. And uh, when we looked at that, you know, what I realised, and I keep saying to ourselves is this, when you realise that there's only six scabby things that actually hold a problem in place, you think, why the hell can't we change the world? Why can't we change the world? If that's all it takes to change the world. So we did reference this in our report back to, uh, back to, uh, uh, the challenge, but we didn't reference it there. But, uh, you know, essentially, if you have a look at this, so I think six things that can change the world. If you've got a problem, if you move six things around, you can get real transformative change. And what we realise is Ngāhapō Ngāti Pro, we actually, so the six things are about policies, practices, resources. Now, what happens is a lot of people just titter around with those ones and they have a little jung, jung, jung. Then you've got relationships. Then you've got power dynamics. And, you know, historically, we can have, you can be in a region and you can all say, oh, yeah, we got good relations, we collaborate with our councils and we play well with each other in the swimming pool. But do we really? Do we really? Do we really truly collaborate? Or do we pretend at collaborating? And then you've got the power, see, the power dynamics. So, you know, we scrap as whānau, then we scrap as hapu, then we scrap as iwi, and so all of these things are all sitting there. And so when you look at, the, when you look at our piece of legislation and you look at, when we talk about marine governance and what this opportunity gives us, the policies that we have in our, in our world are actually our Ngārohe Mōna o Ngāti Pro Act, nothing better than your legal construct. We have a legal contract which guarantees us rights and interests. The practices within our deed of agreement which underpins the Act, they're actually an acknowledgement of our LOR practices. They're actually an acknowledgement that our worldview is what's important in Ngārohe Mōno o Ngāti Pro. It's not the fisheries regulations. It's actually our worldview. So, and anyway, when you live in Wharaponga and Waipito Bay and you're the only people that have been there since pre-treaty and, you know, you still all own your, own your whenua because that's one of the beautiful things about Ngāti Pro is it's too far away from anywhere so no one really wanted to come and steal our whenua other than one or two peeps <laughs> or institutions, one might say. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, we, we, we have a real, we have a real strong ethos around mana motuhake, tinoranga tiratanga. I mean, we see research written in Wharaponga, written by the Crown, that actually says, oh, we don't go down that hill, those Maoris might still eat you kind of stuff. And that's not too long ago, so, yeah. So when it comes to power dynamics and our relationships, you know, effectively, well, well resourcing, we got some dosh from the government, uh, but more importantly than DOSH when it comes to resourcing, it's like those relationship instruments. What the Crown promises you on how they will interact with you is worth more than a million bucks, if you can keep them to their word as per the piece of legislation that was crafted up for us. Um, so our, our relationships, like Pia mentioned, some of our biggest relation, our challenges are about ourselves. And our, um, but more importantly in this world, what this world says to us is, Ngā hapo Ngāti you have a direct relationship with the Crown. 
It is not through the iwi authority. It is through your hapu and the crown. So when it comes to talk about these places called Whareponga and Waipirubu, the trust that manages those respective areas, they are the only organisations that the Fisheries New Zealand team can talk to around customary fisheries. Not the Marae Committee, not, any, not the Ewi Authority, but the Kaitiaki Trust. So our legislation guarantees and says to Crown agents, if you want to do anything about this thing called Ngārohe Mōna Act, you must work through the respective trust, not through anyone else. So you see we've got all those successful... That recipe is a recipe made in heaven when it comes to Ngāhapo or Ngāti Prae. The last part we are missing is this big important part called the mental models or your mindset. So what happens is sometimes we don't realise that we actually negotiated this agreement. We are, it's not the Crown's agreement. We actually went to the Crown as a result of, of the Ngati Upper case. We actually went to the Crown, not as a treaty settlement, not as a grievance, but through sheer negotiation, because our pakeke were clever enough to say they understood what toi tu to mana was, toi tu to mana whenua, me to mana mona. They signed this agreement because of those four principles. They didn't sign this agreement because of the 19 um, instruments that guarantee how the Crown will work with us. So we've got to work with ourselves about how do we change our mindsets to make all of those things work really well. So, you know, I think anyone can do that. And if you move all of them around and not just some of them around, you should be able to create transformative change. And we just want to finish off with actually saying what we realised after going through our research, we do have an indigenous solution to marine governance and management in our rohe mona, and that is the legislative pathway that our pakeke carved out for us. It is the work that the research team has done in translating a lot of all of that, um, all of that systems uh, stuff and bringing our mātauranga together and actually moving forward. So we pull these pictures together to show that when we talk about our world, it's actually not just us. Um, the whole whānau and the hapu are behind us. Uh, we had a wānanga just recently and we counted up that in our little valley in Whareponga, I think we got to something like 75 people live in our little valley. So some pictures here and what works, what we realise that works really well is nothing gets our people off their butts quicker than bringing some scientists into a room. <laughs> you put some scientists into a room, man, our fellas in there like that. And you know why they're in there like that? Because they love talking about, but you know I can do this, I can do that, and this happens when, and this happens when. And so you bring scientists in the room, that picture up there is at Otago University, uh, that one there and that one there, and that's when we did our baseline surveys. And yeah, so, and our fellas, you can't, you know, if you have a wee and talk policy, no one comes, but you bring that tall, gawky party of scientists over there, and every man in his dog comes. Uh, yeah, no, so we've got the deed in the middle, and more importantly, it's our place, that's uh, Whareponga there, Waipiroa Bay over there, that's where we went in to um, do the Modi Compass test. And yeah, essentially the deed of agreement and our act in the middle, and really for the benefit of not only the retention of our practice of yesterday and the way we do it today, but more importantly for the future. Sure.